Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last day of the meeting. I want to join everyone in um, extending my sincere thank you to Walter and actually to everyone who's who's helped organize um, this meeting. It's it's a great treat to be here in this beautiful city. And um, you know, I was so excited to come in 2020, and the universe had different plans, um, but we're here now, so we can celebrate that. Um, so when I sent Walter my um, abstract and title, I actually didn't know what I was going to talk about. Um, I didn't know what I was going to talk about on Monday, and I thought I'll just go with the flow because we have a number of exciting projects going on in the group right now. But as it turns out, I stuck with the same title um, because I, I really have heard a lot of interest in, in simulations of complex pro processes in lipid bilayer membranes. And so I am an experimentalist. For those of you who don't know me, um, we are primarily spectroscopists, and I'll be talking about the types of experiments that we do. Um, and we've become very interested in physical processes that occur in lipid bilayer membranes. Um, and so I'm going to take this from the perspective of what, as an experimentalist, we find interesting and challenging and where I think there are some really key points that we need help from our theoretical friends or friends who are theorists. Um, so before I begin, I want to thank the people who've done the work. Um, the work that I've been going to tell you about today has been done by a couple previous graduate students, mainly Rebecca Shrestha and Carrie Anderson. Um, uh, Sydney Povolaitis, who just graduated about a month ago, and then a former postdoc, Chad Drexler, who just moved on also a couple months ago, and is currently being carried on by Morgan Manich right here. Um, the work that I'm going to be telling you about has been done in very close collaboration with Ron Elber, who's a computational chemist in my department, and I'll be talking quite a bit about, about what we've done together, um, as well as a research scientist who works with him, Alfredo Cardenas. And it's primarily been funded by the NIH, the Welch Foundation, and the Binational Science Foundation, which is a, an Israeli organization that funds collaborations between Israel and the United States, and I'll talk about why that's important at the very end. Okay, so I know several of you um, for quite a long time now, and you've heard me talk in one way or another, probably about something called vibrational star effect spectroscopy, which Steve Boxer gave us a fantastic introduction to yesterday. Um, I'm not going to be talking about vibrational Stark today. I will be talking about Stark because Stark is merely electrochromic. It turns out it doesn't matter where that shift is. And I'll tell you about that later when we actually get to that point. So I wanted to start by, again, telling you from my perspective as an experimentalist, what's really interesting and, and what are the big holes in our knowledge? And there are many. And I like this as an introductory figure. I just pulled this out of a biology textbook of just kind of an artistic rendition of the cell. And the reason I wanted to put this up for this particular crowd is to remind us all that there is no one such thing as the lipid bilayer membrane. Membranes in prokaryotic cells are chemically very complex. I'll talk more about that in a second. But they're also just many different types of membranes. There's, of course, the plasma membrane, which encapsulates the entire cell. There's a nuclear membrane. There are mitochondrial membranes, Golgi membranes, et cetera. And something that's been really exciting in what I would say the last 15 years or so is um, the growth of this field of lipidomics led largely by our mass spec experimental um, friends who have spent a lot of time cataloging the chemical identity of the lipids that are in all of these different membranes. And it's now becoming quite clear that they're chemically very different. And that certainly must be important for the various physiologically relevant processes that are happening in every membrane. It's also important to remember that membranes are composed of thousands of different molecules. So we're talking about a system that's chemically quite more diverse than, say, our 20 amino acids or our four <laughs> nucleotides. Um, and has lipids, has, of course, all the proteins that are intercalated or tethered or in some other way integrated into the membrane, small molecules like cholesterol. And um, it's becoming increasingly clear that these are not just homogeneously distributed two-dimensional fluids, that these membranes actually aggregate into heterogeneous domains that um, enrich some molecules and exclude others. And these domains appear to give additional function to the membrane. 
but they're very hard to study because they're small in both time, probably, you know, sub microsecond or so, and space. So we're talking nanometers. And those are two very difficult conditions to study at the same time. So let me talk a little bit more about what I mean by chemical diversity. So um, prokaryotes in general, certainly humans and other mammalians, um, have uh, thousands of different kinds of lipids. And all of this um, uh, variation comes really from three factors. It comes, whoops, excuse me, it comes from the structure of the head group, that is what is exposed to the aqueous solution. It comes from the structure of the fatty acid tail, how many tails, first of all, how long, are they unsaturated? If so, how many degrees of unsaturation? And then finally, the linkage that connects those two parts. And it's really swapping all of these through a tremendous variety of different chemical structures that we see in relevant membranes, just some of them listed here, that give us this just incredibly diverse collection of molecules in real cells. There are, of course, also other molecules besides proteins that are quite relevant for membranes, the most important of which certainly is cholesterol, um, but there are other biologically relevant small molecules in the sterile family that um, are increasingly being associated with particular disease states um, when they're either there instead of cholesterol or in combination with cholesterol, and we're becoming increasingly interested in some of them, a couple of which I've just shown here. Going back to this idea of that artistic rendition of the cell that I showed you a couple slides ago, not just are there many different organelles in our cells that actually have membranes, but these membranes are chemically different. And this is where, as I said, our mass spec friends have been so useful. So what I'm showing you here is a, a, a very important um, review paper. It was actually a meta-analysis from now several years ago that looked at a lot of different um, mass spec lipidomic studies of mammalian cells in general. So this isn't one particular species. And in particular was interested in cataloging the type of lipids. So this is an abbreviation for say, phosphocholine, phosphoserine, cardiolipin, cholesterol, et cetera, um, in three different um, important membranes, the plasma membrane, which is again, the outer membrane, the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum. And all I want you to get away from looking at this figure is just that there are vast chemical differences in these different types of organelles. And so we're gonna have to develop models both experimentally and computationally that allow us to investigate not just the membrane, but a particular interaction in a particular membrane. And then to break down this chemical composition a little bit more specifically, I'm doing something here I tell my students never to do, so don't tell any of them. I'm putting up a table of numbers. The only thing I'm trying to show you right here is here I've taken our broad class of lipids, say phosphocholines or um, you know, phosphoethanolamines, and done a little bit more granular investigation into the structure. Don't worry about these abbreviations. They basically just tell us about the length of the fatty acid. That's what all these numbers are here for. And I'm showing in particular mass spec data from the lipidomics community on four particular membranes that we're, we are interested in. Um, the plasma membrane of what I'm calling normal in cancer cells, I'll come back to what I mean by that later the mitochondria in the ER. And again, don't worry about the exact numbers. What I want you to take away from this is that if you just look either along the x-axis or along the y-axis, there are very different um, compositions as you look at a particular organelle. This also emphasizes that um, not just are we dealing with a complicated system, which I hope I've convinced you of uh, in the last couple of minutes, but it's a system that changes over the natural course of the life cycle of the cell, but also as a function of disease. And so I'm showing you here two identical cell lines, and I'll come back to why I'm interested in these later, one of which is a functional norm normal cell and the other of which has metastasized. And there's some really key chemical differences in those lipids that are in the membrane. And in fact, these are now um, so widely recognized that they're actually accepted as biomarkers of a particular type of cancer in a particular type of tissue. Okay, so the diagnostics community is using them to help um, um, improve their um, uh, you know, response to sick patients. And we need to be using them in order to try to understand how say a cancer and, and uh, cancer membrane differs from a normal membrane. 
Okay, and then of course there's water, right? The most basic molecule of all, this is all in water. Here I'm showing you uh, just a, a representative snapshot from my collaborator, Ron Elbert. The particular membrane and system that I'm showing you here is not important. What I want you to take away from this is that the green um, hydrophobic, you know, the fatty acid part of the membrane is, you know, it's in the interior of this lipid bilayer as we suspect. The phosphocholines, this, this is a DOPC membrane, so the, the surface is all phosphocholines somewhere up here. Each of these phosphocholines are very bulky molecules, and as it turns out, they can, they can hydrogen bond to a lot of water. So if you just do an MD simulation of, say, DOPC in water, you can easily put about 10 to 12 water molecules around that Zwitter ion, okay? So there's a ton of water at the head group region itself, and if you look in this simulation, there's water that's actually made it fairly far into this supposedly hydrophobic interior just in a room temperature simulation. I'm gonna be showing you some structures later, which demonstrate that this actually could be an important mechanism for some particular peptide function you might be interested in, actually dragging waters into the membrane in order to say, complete a hydrogen bond. So we have to remember that, um, you know, I certainly learned um, in my probably high school biology class that bilayers were just this simple sandwich, right? Kind of a, a bread of hydrophilic and a, a, a meat of hydrophobic. They're so much more chemically complicated. And this community, I think, is really well equipped to deal with that in all of its glory. Okay, so um, having done just a basic introduction of um, the way I, as an experimentalist, like I said, think about the models that we're gonna to try to build in order to understand relevant function in a membrane. The function that I'm gonna be focusing on for this re the rest of this talk is the unassisted transport of small, quote unquote small, I'll tell you what I mean by that, um, permeance through the membrane, okay? Um, and this is interesting for a variety of reasons. Um, I mean, intellectually, it's it's just kind of cool to think about how a membrane can get a molecule or yeah, how the structure of a membrane can get a molecule from one side to the other without the benefit of any say evolved protein channel or, or enzyme or something like that. It's also incredibly important as we've already heard for drug design, um, thinking about molecules that can make it through the membrane to target um, an interesting um, uh, you know, physiological effect inside the cell but without a, a transporter or a channel to do it for them. And so our starting point for this several years ago now was a class of peptides called cell penetrating peptides. So these are relatively short segments. And by short, I mean, say 25 to 35 amino acids that are not just in the cell by themselves, like say an intrinsically disordered protein, they are found as um, snippets of larger protein sequences. And it's that portion of the sequence that is um, so effective at getting through the membrane that it actually drags the rest of the protein through it. Okay, um, let me get some water. <clears throat> um, these were identified a number of years ago, um, largely by kind of data scientists who were just sort of mining newly generated proteum data and finding these segments in proteins and, and then going back and, and trying to catalog what their function was. An interesting property of this class of peptides is that they tend to be highly positively charged. So in that segment of say 25 to 35 amino acids, there are lots of arginines and lysines. Um, I'll show you a specific sequence here in a bit. Um, and that's a really interesting question, right? Again, if we think about the membrane as having this hydrophobic interior, how is it that peptides that are so efficient at going through that interior that they pull an entire protein with them um, are first of all charged at all, and second of all, why positive? Why not negative? And that was really a very simplistic question that motivated our first work in this several years ago, and has turned out to be very fruitful. Um, they're also quite interesting, by the way, for the biotechnology community for reasons that should not surprise you, because if you can put them on some sort of artificial cargo, they can be a way of getting a therapeutic into a cell. Um, so there is a potential, and I've, I've actually talked about this before, 
there is a potential that drops because of all those water molecules, hydrogen bound to the phosphate head group, or you know, the phosphocholine that drops across the, the first few angstroms of the interior of the, the membrane. Yes. I thought it was really positive. It's, it's, it's quite large. Yeah. And yeah. So okay, so I'm amplifying your yeah. why is it an arginine? Why why is it arginine and lysine? Exactly. Um, okay, that's all I want to say about that. So I'm an experimentalist. We need to um, define a model system that's going to be tractable, that's going to be something that we can control and that we can tweak as we need to and as we learn about it. And so um, the experiments that I'm going to be talking to you about it today reduce all of this complexity that I've been talking about to spherical vesicles that are about 150 nanometers in diameter. Their composition is whatever lipid or mixture of lipids we choose. Um, we make them, we characterize the wazoo out of them, and I'd be happy to talk about that. I'm not going to mention any of that here today. And when we started, our model for a CPP in general was tryptophan. <laughs> Um, and, and this is where Ron and I started working closely together. And it just always makes me giggle because Ron calls tryptophan a peptide. I would call it a molecule, but for him, it's a peptide. The reason we chose tryptophan is that this indole ring is fluorescent and it's actually um, quite a polar um, fluorescent molecule. Now, I know we're trained to think about tryptophan as being one of our nonpolar amino acids, but from the perspective of some of the other fluorescent dyes that we work with in my group, there's actually quite a large dark dipole moment that drops across this indole ring right here. Um, and that's convenient because the Stark effect, as um, Steve taught us about yesterday, is when the dipole moment of a molecule or of a spectroscopic transition interacts with a field. OK, um, and the magnitude of both the vectors and well, the, so the magnitude of the dipole moment and, and the, the field and then the direction of the vectors is going to determine the strength of that interaction. And in a fluorescent molecule like tryptophan, that shows up as a shift in fluorescence. OK, so this is 100 percent a stark effect, just like Steve taught us about yesterday, it's just in a different region of the spectrum. And it's an emitter, not an absorber. We're gonna test charge in our initial experiments by playing around with the protonation of the backbone. So we're going to work with a positively charged molecule by doing our experiments at low pH. We're gonna work with a negatively charged molecule by doing them at high pH. And believe me, we did all of the, um, the controls to make sure that in this simple system, pH effects were not explaining our measurements. And again, I'd be happy to talk about it later. I'm going to go through the example of tryptophan in some kind of detail just to give you an example of how we do these experiments and the type of information that we get. Um, and then um, near the, um, later in the end of my talk, begin um, discussing uh, more complicated molecules that we're working on more recently. OK, so with this polar tryptophan fluorescer, we can take advantage of the fact that its fluorescent energy is going to be largely affected by the reaction field set up by the solvent environment that it's in. And so here's just a quick example of that, much akin to what Steve showed us yesterday. These are fluorescence energy um, uh, emission spectra of a single tryptophan dissolved up either in hexanes, which is kind of a, a poor man's lipid bilayer interior, and then a variety of aqueous. Um, aqueous environments. And you can see there's a very large shift in energy here as we go from the high dielectric to the low dielectric environment, very easy to measure. The second thing that's useful about a polar dye like this is that it's easily quenched by highly polarizable elements in its vicinity. And those can be quite small. So for example, a large atom like bromine. So we also do experiments in which we create these vesicles with some fraction of the lipids um, exchanged with a bromine labeled lipid. And because these are just generated synthetically, we can um, determine completely where we want to put the bromine. So we can move this polarizable atom up and down the chain at will, or rather we can pay people to do it for us. Um, they're happy to take our money, um, which means that when we create vesicles with now a small fraction of the bromine labeled lipid, um, uh, whoop, excuse me, um, doped in, and we measure a quenching of fluorescence, so a drop of the fluorescence um, intensity, 
based on where that bromine is located, we can we know exactly where the tryptophan is located. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So Anna's question, for those of you on Zoom, is, is can it be placed on the head grip and put anywhere you can do the synthetic chemistry? Um, okay, so I'm gonna walk you through a, a set of data that's very typical for what we do, just to understand how we're doing the experiment and how we're um, um, interpreting our data. So in a, the next couple figures, um, positively charged tryptophan is here on the left, negatively charged tryptophan is here on the right. The experiment that we're going to do is we make our vesicles, we characterize those, and then we incubate with tryptophan, and we just let the system come to equilibrium. And then we pass those vesicles through a size exclusion column, and the vesicles go through, but all small mo molecules like tryptophan get stuck. And so the vesicles pass into a new buffer of whatever we select, and we're going to select the same buffer with no tryptophan. So this is a way of more or less instantaneously removing the vesicles that have any equilibrated tryptophan in them um, from anything in solution. Um, and so, and then we're gonna collect the fluorescent spectrum. And basically the fastest we can do this, it was about 10 minutes. So 10 minutes for us is kind of time zero. What the vesicle looked like the moment to the greatest extent of our ability, we removed it from tryptophan. And we're going to do this with vesicles that are either 100% of our lipid, whatever we choose that to be, or have some fraction in the dashed line here of the bromine labeled lipid doped in. Okay. And we can do that at a very fast time. And then we can just sit around and wait. So for example, this is one hour later in green. We can wait a little bit more. I'm only going to show you data out to four hours here in orange. We, of course, look for much, much longer, but at four hours, everything's equilibrated and we don't see much change after this. Okay, so these are a lot of spectra on a single figure. But what I want you to take away is that the positively charged and negatively charged molecules have very different response leaching back out into the clean solution. Um, so we see, first of all, in the positively charged tryptophan, significantly more quenching of our time zero sample than in the negatively charged molecule. Um, but by four hours, they more or less look the same. We also see a significantly greater energy shift of the positively charged molecule to um, lower wavelength, higher fluorescence energy in the positively charged molecule than the negatively charged molecule, okay? Both of those observations tell us exactly the same thing. At our time zero, there is more positively charged tryptophan in the associated with the membrane um, than negatively charged um, tryptophan, but that they both then re-equilibrate and go out into solution. Now, here's where our collaboration with, yes, Miguel. Can, um, in, a, in a previous uh, results, because you are, lowering pH to 2.4, just to make sure that you have positive uh, tryptophan. Yes. Did you account for uh, protonation of the phosphate on the lipids? Uh, I'm raising this question because we estimated the pKa to be around 2.5. Yes. Uh, it will at least start the protonation. It does not affect your results. I think mm -hmm. it will, the effect of the tryptophan should be higher. Yes. So it's a kind of, it's working against you, I think. So, um. The answer is experimentally, we've done all those controls, absolutely. And we do not, as we change pH, we do not see a difference once after, if we know that we're at a pH that we have the positive charge, doesn't really matter what that is. We scan through that and then the same with the negative charge, okay? Ron is assuming everything is deprotonated in the phosphate. I think you might be right because the moment the tryptophan uh, appears, or oh, the 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 neighborhood of the tryptophan mm -hmm. will induce the deprotonation of the lipid. Yeah. So the protonation might be ha happening elsewhere, uh, yes. away from the tryptophan. So that's why you are seeing. It. Yeah, it makes sense. Completely agreed. Yeah. But this was also a question that constantly nagged us, and one of the reasons we're eventually going to move away from this model, right? Um, okay. So at the same time, Ron is doing uh, atomistically. Um, uh, detailed simulations of this exact system. So tryptophan moving through a membrane slab composed of the same lipid. And he's using this milestoning um, technique that he has that um, probably most of you in the audience can explain better than I can. 
Um, but he's getting, it, it's nice because he can do these very long time simulations and he can drag the molecule through the, the membrane. So we can see something that might take, you know, seconds to hours to actually happen physiologically. Okay, so over here on the right are just the exact same data that I showed you before, positive charges up here. And then on the left is a potential of mean force calculation from these simulations, where the x-axis is the geometric center of the membrane, and the y, um, or, 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 excuse me, zero on the x-axis is the geometric center, and 32 angstroms is out in bulk solution. And what they do is they actually drag the tryptophan into the membrane. And what you see is that for the positively charged molecule here in black, there is a not insignificant um, minima um, of free energy right around 14 angstroms or so that's completely absent in the negatively charged molecule. Okay. And this is my best sort of artist rendition of what, what this actually means because um, we know the structure of, um, of the lipid. Right here at 14 angstroms is exactly where the glycerol linkage is, okay? That's why we're seeing such strong quenching because in this experiment that I've showed you, we put, we've put our bromines as close to that as we can. Um, and so what happens is that the positively charged molecule is hanging out here right around the glycerol. And the reason it's there and not the negatively charged molecule is of course the, the, the glycerol is a hydrogen bond acceptor and it can stabilize its interaction with the tryptophan backbone in a way that the negative charge molecule can't. I mean, it's, it's really very straightforward. And I already showed you this figure, but now let's actually talk about what it is. So this is a representative snapshot of that low energy minimum structure. Here is the tryptophan right here. The indole ring is coming out of the plane at us. Here is the amide backbone. And what we see is that it is indeed interacting um, strongly with the glycerol, um, the glycerol region of the lipid. Um, um, here's, here's this fun little water molecule that comes along for the ride. And what is so interesting about this figure, and we've seen this now a couple of times at, in posters and, and in talks, is how distorted this leaflet of the membrane is. It is really puckered in quite extensively to shepherd the, you know, still relatively hydrophobic indole ring as far as possible into the center of the membrane while still maintaining all of this hydrogen bonding. And again, this is just a room temperature simulation. So the random thermal energy is, is plenty sufficient to lead to these momentary distortions that create this very stable structure. Yes. 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 So this is right. So Maria's question is that the minimum? Yes. This is this is like a representative structure from that 14 angstrom position. Um. So the size of the uh, so experimentally or theoretically, <laughs> computationally. Okay. So our experiment is on 150 nanometer vesicles, and so. For the perspective of the tryptophan, it's a flat slab, okay? And so he's also doing his simulation on, I've only, I, we, it took a little chunk here, but I, I'm, I don't remember quite how long this goes, but it's a flat slab. And then this is DOPC, so this is um, like what, six, five, six um, nanometers, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, um, tryptophan's great, but really, okay, so Anna. Can you, can you hold on to yeah, that question? So if, if, hold on to it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, it is, has he done that on something that's not just DOPC? I'll get there. Um, okay, so tryptophan's great. We do have this issue where the charge is coming from pH, and we just don't want to deal with that. Um, and also, it's, you know, just, you know, Ron calls it a peptide. It's just a single amino acid. Okay, so the next thing we did was work up to, we, we thought we'd just go systematically to longer and longer amino acids. And so we started working with these um, trimers and tetramers of um, tryptophan containing molecules where we've now added a lysine. So our tryptophan is there as our fluorophore. Um, these molecules are also doubly charged. They're charged at the N-terminus, at the lysine, but the C-terminus is isolated, both in the experiment and in, in the simulation. So these have a, a plus two charge. And the way these differ is these charges are systematically moved amino acid by amino acid. So we're getting to systematically longer distance between the two charges. So exact same experiment and calculation. I'm showing it slightly different in the experimental side over here on the right, 
where I'm actually just showing the concentration of tryptophan that we know goes into the membrane as a function of time since we spike it with tryptophan. What we see is that the tetramer here in blue goes in so quickly, we essentially can't measure the rise. We just see it all the way in. Whereas the two trimers um, are much, much lower, orders of magnitude slower. The simulation is over here on the left. Again, this is a milestone in simulation. I'm now showing the, the x-axis right here as Ron's milestone reaction coordinate. 0.5 now is the geometric center of the membrane, and 0 and 1 are aqueous solution on either side. And then again, this is just a free energy calculation. So the colors match here. Blue goes with blue. Um, and I think it's most instructive to look at the difference between the tetramer in blue and the trimer that's just one less tryptophan in red. So what we see is that both of these peptides have a pretty significant free energy minimum in the middle of the membrane, if they can make it there. That minimum is lower for the tetramer. They have both a very high energy barrier that they have to get over to get to that minimum. But again, it's lower in the tetramer and the trimer. Yes. Yeah, uh, you have this reaction coordinate. Yeah. And the, it's the distance between the center of the membrane and one point on the, on the peptide. And this point on the peptide is the center of mass? That is a good question. And again, I'm not an expert in the simulations. That seems reasonable to me. Yeah. Yeah, because, well, if it's uh, some point on the first tryptophan or in the lysine is different, so. Yeah, so we didn't pick, say, one specific charge. We wanted to know on average where it was. So, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can I, can I yes. ask also, um, when you did the experiments, uh, I'm sure that you kept all the charges pro protonated. Yes. Uh, so charged. Yes. Uh, but when you, when you did the experiments, you just used pH 7. Yes. So by doing that, the N terminus in the membrane is neutral for sure. I know. I'm and gonna get this question. I'm an, I'm it, an audience the, full of people. In the ester people. region, yeah. it will be neutral. Okay. Also. So, so the energy barrier should be smaller. So we do not know what the size, uh, excuse me, what the charge of the peptide is as it goes through. Absolutely, 100%. And that is actually a very, very difficult thing to measure. I would measure. expect the barriers to be slightly lower. Okay. <laughs> You could just do simulations with different charges. There are not that many combinations, right? So Yeah, and we did that with the tryptophan. We did the Zwitter ion, and then because it's a simulation, they did just the totally neutral molecule, which cracked me up. Um, I don't know that they did that many combinations for this, to be perfectly honest. Um, Maria. It gets it to extremes. It doesn't mean that you get the right answer. <laughs> I thought you said they did simulations with just normal neutral tryptophan. They just... And right. the Zwitter ion. Uh, and Zwitter yeah. ion. But, but just for that single tryptophan, right. I don't know that they did it for these. Right. Well, we should believe Ron Elber knows how to drag a molecule through the membrane. Are you, so experimentally, you can look at the pH dependence. And if you, say, raise the pH enough, you're you're going to get rid of at least one. See that, if that changes it. That's absolutely true. And we, we didn't. That's yeah. one, one variation that we haven't gotten to. It's expensive, Marilyn. No, no. The vesicles themselves are stable over a very large pH range. So, so if any worries about simulations, the only worry would be uh, how did they do with the orientational kind of, because that would be very expensive. But I mean, again, Elber knows how to run simulations, so he probably dealt with that. I, I to, <laughs> those are questions I just can't answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, but basically people are worried about all kinds of things. So I think the only degree of freedom which is really complicated here is the rotation. Like yeah. Sampled when you're dragging. Question? Okay. So the model that we came up from those data taken together, um, and again, experiment theory, I, I showed you kinetics for experiment and free energy for theory, but they completely align. Is something like this. The two charges enter 
the surface of the membrane and they interact near that glycerol region exactly the way that I just showed you with tryptophan here in B. But at some point, there can be a somersault. And after that somersault occurs, the two charges are now separated and each can be stabilized by either leaflet of the membrane. Now, and this, this is that free energy minimum. And then of course here it can go backwards or it can go forwards, do another somersault and then eventually exit the membrane. Um, and the reason that these three different peptides behave so differently is that because we've increased the length of the, the space between the two charges, the extent of the puckering, the extent of this distortion is less, the further apart they are. And this is just a cartoon, but of course we have all the structures. So I'm just showing you here the trimer and the uh, tetramer that I've been emphasizing. And again, you can see that we have atomistically detailed structures and Ron does all of his I, I, what a radius gyration and all of that stuff that, that we can prove that this isn't just a hand wavy conclusion. Okay, and we, we have worked on some other peptides, right? We thought we'd just build up systematically, but as it turns out, we got approached by um, a woman named Rahel Nushatai, who is a um, Hebrew university, and she is what I would call a big B biologist. Um, she works with cells and she works with mice. Um, and she has for a long time, for her own reasons, been interested in this cell penetrating peptide right here. It comes from, like I said, these are segments of larger proteins. This comes from a protein called NAF1. I'm just going to call the peptide NAF1, although that's technically not um, correct. It's just, this, that's what I mean when I say NAF1. It sequences right here. I'm sorry you have to, to twist your head. It has a relatively hydrophobic end terminal region. And then starting right here at this arginine, it goes into five um, positive charges an arginine and four lysines. Um, so a very high, heavily charged um, C terminal region. And Rahel has been interested for reasons of her own in how this interacts with actual cells. So right here, I'm showing you a different kind of fluorescence experiment. So this peptide has been labeled with a fluorophore. It doesn't have a tryptophan in it. And tryptophan would not be bright enough to do these types of, of microscopy experiments anyway. So this is labeled with a different fluorophore that, that um, fluoresces green. The two cell lines right here, here on the left, MCF10A, is a standard cell line that's commonly used to represent healthy breast epithelial tissue. MDAMB231 is, again, a commonly used in the laboratory cell line to look at metastasized breast epithelial tissue. So these are the exact same tissues, one healthy, one cancerous. So I'm just going to call them normal and, and cancer from, from now on. So her experiment is she's just growing these cells. They're all happy. They're living their life. And she then puts them in the microscope and then exposes them to um, this fluorescently labeled NAF1 and just watches what happens over time. So over a long period of time, you can see that the NAF1 begins interacting with the plasma membrane of the cell. So this right here is an outline of one particular cell. And the NAF1 is definitely there. It is co-localized co with that membrane, but it hasn't gone any further. Whereas in the cancer version of this tissue, yes, it starts localizing with the plasma, but then it goes inside the cell and starts interacting with these smaller little blobs right here. And she knows from her EM um, um, imaging that she then does of these cells after they've been fixed, that these little blobby things right here are the mitochondria. So this peptide is trafficking to the mitochondria and then hanging out. And here's what's so interesting and why she came to us. Um, this, these data over here are cell viability assay of, again, healthy and cancerous cell. And so what she's doing is she's taking them cells, exposing um, them to the peptide, and then just watching what happens over a period of days. The gray is the control. The white is with the peptide. The healthy cell doesn't change at all. The cancerous cell begins to die and eventually dies off quite rapidly. And this is extremely exciting because, as I assume most of you know, one of the big problems in cancer research is its many methods are highly non-selective. Right, So you hope you kill the cancer before you kill the person. This seems to, when exposed to the same tissue type, be able to distinguish healthy from cancer. So this is really exciting, but of course we have no idea about what the mechanism is. I will add that in that table of numbers that I showed you right at the beginning of my talk, I had a bunch of um, um, uh, quantities of different lipid identities in terms of mole percentage in what I called cancer and normal, those data were actually collected from these two cell lines, 
Okay, so we actually know explicitly what the lipid difference is in the plasma, the mitochondria, and the endoplasmic reticulum of these two cell lines. And so we're going to do the exact same experiment that I've been talking about now with NAF1. Miguel, how much time do I have? I think I must be by five minutes. Okay, I'm almost done. Excellent. So we're doing exactly the same idea. We don't have a quenching. We don't have an ability yet to quench it. We're thinking about how we can do that. So we're really now just looking at changes in fluorescence that tell us is it in an aqueous environment or in a, a peptide environment. Um, and then at the same time, Ron is doing what I would consider just damn near heroic simulations um, of this peptide moving through the DOPC membrane. We're still at DOPC, lip, um, Anna, sorry, um, I'll get there. Um, and so what this is showing, these red dots right here, the first red dot is that arginine, which is that first positively charged amino acid. And then the other red dot out here is that terminal lysine. And so what we see is exactly the same mechanism that I've shown you now a couple different times, although more complicated. The two charges begin interacting with the surface of the membrane um, to shepherd the more hydrophobic component into the interior. There is then some sort of somersault and it does the exact same thing on the way out. And again, we see significant distortion of the leaflet that the charges are actually interacting with, okay? So this is just a cartoon of, of what I just said. Okay, now I spent the first. Can I? Uh, yes. Uh, when you you were just showing the mechanism, and I think it's yeah. pretty much what I would expect. Uh, my my issue regarding the difference between normal cancer and uh, tumor cancer, uh, I think the difference comes from the, the neonic lipids and that the presence of the anionic lipids will change the protonation level of your peptide. Yes. So if you were paying attention to that table of data that I showed you, you would have noticed that the single greatest difference in the plasma membrane of healthy versus normal is the presence of ionic lipids, um, anionic lipids, excuse me. They're all in a smaller amount, but yes. Much, much smaller amount, right? So we go up to like 20 mole percent um, you guys are really observant. Good job. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go back. I believe you. I, I'm sure it's right. A, a difference between 2 molar percent and 12 molar percent is huge, right? Think about all that additional charge you put into the plasma membrane. Yeah. Really not a biologist, but that's kind of stuck with me. So. I think in mitochondria, flipping of the cardio, cardiolipin that is exposing the anionic to the surface starts apoptosis. Exactly. Okay. So, so, so can you can you hang on just a second? I'm gonna get to Anna's question. I want to finish because I I, I don't want to hold us up. Um, so we are starting to make mixed lipids. Everything that I've shown you so far ignores all that interesting complexity I tried to, to ex get you excited about. So we've started moving on to anionic lipids. We're doing, again, the exact same series of experiments, and we can now compare this to everything that we have before. We have very good experimental handles when we to understand how when we tweak one particular aspect of our system, we understand what the data are. So for example, here are three anionic lipids. Um, we're doing another fluorescence experiment. I'm just showing it to you in a slightly different way. And we see that um, phosphonic acid has by far the biggest effect once we start making mi mixed monolayers. We think that just really has to do with the fact that it's sterically much smaller. It's easier to displace water that's associated with this phosphate group. And so that initial event of, of interacting with the membrane is easier. Um, and then to get to Maria's point, the last thing I want to leave you with, and I didn't tell you this, but an additional layer of complexity is that real biological membranes are asymmetric. They have different lipid compositions on one leaflet versus another. And in fact, it's the loss of that complexity that um, is, again, something like a signal for apoptosis. And it's something, again, we see in cancer membranes. And so we very recently, this was literally just accepted like a week ago, have learned how to make these well-controlled vesicles mm -hmm. that, have, that are completely asymmetric. We can control the lipid composition on the inside versus the outside at will. And so we're now start to, starting to think about chemical gradients of lipids and how that affects all this. And Ron, at the same time, 
time is pretty confident that he can do these simulations in now these, these mixed lipid systems. I don't yet have an example of where we compare experiment and theory, but we are working hard on it. Okay, I'm going to end there because I want to leave, if I have any more time, um, you, you all have asked really great questions um, so far, so thank you for that, and I'd be happy to, to talk about this, of course, in the future. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Go ahead. Can I have just a tiny one? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I'm actually doing this asymmetric membranes, and I think that there is more anionic uh, lipids in the inner membrane than in the outer membrane. And maybe it has something to do with the um, positively charged thing going through. Because there, there is more uh, negative charge on one side, right? Yeah, um, so something that our asymmetric vesicles allow us to do is explicitly test what's the role of charge on the outside versus the inside. So here, for example, on the, on the left is a, a vesicle in which we've kept the inner membrane the same and then varied the concentration of phosphonic acid in this case. We see a fairly strong outer leaflet effect and we see almost no inner leaflet effect, okay? Going back to Maria's point, um, it's what, what happens that what, what, a, what a biologist would tell you about what happens is that in a cell that in some way is getting unhealthy, it's this scrambling that's literally just a lipid mixing between the leaf leaflets that exposes all this negative charge to the surface that then triggers apoptosis. Oh, oh okay, and, and there are enzymes that do that too, yes. Yeah, to trigger apoptosis, yes. Oh, what the, one is passive, one is active, um, I, I, but they both have the same effect, as far as I know. Yeah, it, it basically, do you have a good hypothesis on basically your cancer cells have tendency to be more acidic overall, and they also difficult to trigger the death signal. Yeah. And somehow this thing does exactly that against those anionic signals. So we, we have, are perfectly capable of building vesicles that have different pHs inside, or pH, pH, pHs, excuse me, I'm talking too much, inside and outside. <laughs> so you don't want to do a hypothesis until so, you did the measurement. Um, well, we're not, we don't risk apoptosis for our vesicles, right? Because um, uh, there's nothing in there that will do that. But we can make something that is the, the uh, higher pH of a cancer cell on the inside and the lower pH outside. All to come. It's very interesting. Thank Can you. I make a comment? Yes. Uh, I, it, when I look at your data, my interpretation is um, as long as you don't, have, you don't have anionic lipids exposed on the outer layer of, of your cells or your, or, or your uh, liposomes, um, whenever you don't have those, uh, your lysines are not fully charged. Your positive charge, arginines are, but all the others, when they are at uh, Easter, uh, region of the lipids, they are not fully charged. And then they don't create an instability large enough. When you start uh, flip-flopping lipids and exposing anionic lipids to the outside, uh, and of course, pH might have an effect, but on your experience, they might not have such an effect um, because it needs a, a microenvironment to, to lower pH enough so that you have an, an effect. But the lipids, the negative lipids, will increase the, proton, the, the protonation and the charge of your, so you, your peptide becomes more effective because of that. And then it creates, and then it, they, they pull the ionic lipids back to them and create the instability in that region. And then it allows to flip onto the other side. That will be my interpretation because it's the same interpretation we use for our uh, cationic peptides. Yeah. All I can tell you is the simulations have been done with everything assuming unit charge on what we think is charged. Um, and that we have yet to think of good way to figure out exactly when a lysine gets protonated. So stay tuned. There's a lot here. Sure. Hi. Uh, I have a few questions, so <laughs> so tell me if I'm talking too much. So we were talking about the asymm uh, asymmetry of the membranes, but you showed um, entry mechanism that did not take that into consideration. So how do you expect the asymmetry of the membrane to affect the mechanism that you showed? Stay tuned. Okay, thank you. My uh, another question was the simulations that you showed for that mechanism. Uh, they were probably steered MD, no? Uh, milestoning, which is Ron Elber's sort of okay. hobby. Um, but 
for that, you can calculate permeability coefficients or no? Oh, um, what he normally likes to do is calculate mean first passage time because we can compare that directly to our okay. kinetic data. I don't know about permeability. I mean, if we have free energies, we should be able to get that okay. right. Because my question was if there was any other effect about the permeation of the compounds into the cancer cells aside from just permeability, because we know that cancer have leaky membranes, so it could have something else to do with that. That is such a complicated I know. question. I guess one idea I would leave you li with is, um, uh, so, so th this is a, a structure, <clears throat> there actually isn't a good crystal structure of NAF1 interacting with the membrane, so this is just modeled in. But we do know from Ron's simulations, it's approximately one half alpha helical, the other half sort of eh. Um, we are doing a lot of experiments these days with concentration dependence. Um, everything that I've shown you so far with NAF1 has been one micromolar or lower, okay? We now have pretty good evidence that even just increasing that by an order of magnitude may be creating aggregates. Mm -hmm. And what actually may be happening is that more than one, you, you need some sort of unit at those higher concentrations to go into the membrane at once. We don't think that's happening for our very low concentrations, but it may be happening at higher concentrations. And so now it's a matter of, if, of trying to figure out to the best of our ability, what is the concentration and the membrane composition that is most relevant for the, the experiment in, in that microscopy visualization of what actually happens to the cells. Um, but th this is getting more and more complicated. And I think you just asked a question that kind of fully encapsulates all of the particular questions we need to test systematically one by one. Okay, thank you. Okay, really like your presentation. Actually, I want your opinion mm -hmm. about something I started doing and I just started doing. And I promise Miguel that I'll pay attention to the force field, to the charged lipids, I promise you. <laughs> and then I, I, I got some antimicrobial peptides that they have some charged residues and we change the charged residues change position and we have like 10 that they have different charges but some of them have the same charges just positioning different we have experimental data to compare of leak, leaking of the inside liposome liquid okay and we see the, the experimental data said that some of these peptides are like 20% alpha helix. Some of them are 50, some are then 60. And we want to go to this side to see the structure that they have upon insertion. But I wanted your opinion about what do you think that could be relevant about these ones that have the same charge, but the positioning is different. What do, do you think you wanted to see? Yeah. If the paper was with you, <laughs> well, well, what so I, I, I don't want to see anything, right? I, I want to learn yeah. about it. Um, you know, I, Miguel, was it you? Did you show the structure of the the antimicrobial peptide in a nice alpha helix, or was it one of one of the students, maybe day one or so? I did. And oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Let's talk about it later because what what I noticed is that your positive charges were distributed in such a way that they would all be on the same side of an alpha helix. Okay, that is one of the fundamental driving forces. Yeah, but that one was exactly like the one that Nature did. Mm -hmm. Now I want to mix and match. You know. Yeah, so if you put two charges right next to each other, I guarantee you, you're not going to get a, a, a tight alpha helix, right? Um, um, and it's a relatively short peptide, and so you should be able to do that kind of mixing and matching, um, provided you know you have confidence in your simulation and all that. I think it's a very, very interesting question. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much.